Hey, so sorry if you were expecting a big, like, opener skit on this one. I had one planned, uh, you know, if, especially to follow up the Fathomless with that insanity. Uh, the problem was, you know, I got the props in. I got this genie lamp here off Amazon. Um, and then I had to try and track down some smoke bombs. And whenever they actually came in the mail, it turns out that the manufacturer was, like, <laughs> labeled themselves as a gender reveal party supply company and you know i figured number one i've had enough bad run-ins with fireworks in my life and i'm just not gonna push it on that and then number two it's probably best for the sake of like just a youtube video that i'm not just setting all of you know the midwest on fire so we're just gonna get right into it with the genie warlock this is actually a really interesting option that's focused more around more out of combat centric stuff but there's enough in combat love that we're not well let me turn that around there's enough out of combat love in this that we're not really used to seeing in a warlock and i like the direction that this is going definitely like if i was to push for a favorite in tasha's it's most likely that i'm going to think between this and the fathomless I, i'm really pushing towards the genie there's just so many unique kinds of characters that you can get out of this the playstyle is extremely unique. Let's go over into D&D &D Beyond, and I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. The Genie. You've made a pact with one of the rarest kinds of Genie, a Noble Genie. Such entities rule vast fiefs on the elemental planes, and have great influence over lesser Genies and elemental creatures. Noble Genies are varied in their motivations, but most are arrogant and wield power that rivals that of lesser deities. They delight in turning the tables on mortals, who often bind Genies into servitude, and readily enter into packs that expand their reach. Getting into this subclass, immediately what happens is it's going to branch off, right? Not all these genies are super equal, but your choice is going to align you with a certain element, so you could just roll a d4 on here and then go with that genie. Uh, the Dao is going to align you with Earth, the genie is going to align you with Air, the Afridi is going to align you with Fire, and then the Merit is going to align you with Water. Your choice right here is going to split off into what you can access with your expanded spell list. Just as a reminder, with a Warlock, you don't immediately get these and they're just known and they don't count against your spells like so many other options do. This is just whenever you can get Warlock spells, you can choose from this list as well as the Warlock spell list. So the base genie spells are pretty all right. Detect Evil and Good, Situationally Strong, Phantasmal Force, pretty decent overall. It does require your concentration, so that means it's going to compete with Hex. But overall, for a second level spell slot, I think this is actually a pretty decent trade-off. Uh, create food and water at fifth level. If you're playing in survival heavy campaigns, this is here. Great for out of combat uh, exploration kinds of stuff. Uh, if you're in a survival heavy campaign, this is purple. Otherwise, this is just situational. Uh, Phantasmal Killer, I do feel like is relatively weak. Doesn't like it. Just doesn't really feel like a fantastic warlock spell overall. Um, I mean, it not only is it tied into the Frightened Condition, but like, oh man, it, it just, yeah, if it's only going to scale up and do 5d10 psychic damage, I don't really think that this is going to be worth one of your really precious Warlock spell slots. Uh, creation, situational, fun, out of roleplay stuff, uh, really shenanigan heavy. What's interesting is that this is the only Warlock that gets a ninth level spell as a part of its expanded spell list. And that ninth level spell happens to be the strongest spell in the game, Wish. Wish is, in my opinion, the kind of spell that a player should probably only be able to cast once in a campaign, and then, like, it's gone. Like, this needs to be an absolutely legendary moment that completely defines the storyline, and then it just needs to be like, okay, that was there, it's gone. Um, if you factor that in, the fact that they get this and you're looking at this subclass compared to every other warlock, then this is objectively the strongest warlock in the game with wish. Like if we're talking about full 20th level build, right? Um, otherwise, wish you're only going to be able to use this with your mystic arcanum. But like, ooh man, just being able to get with like, oh, God, what a this is such a big game changer, right? Especially like, well, it's Mystic Arcanum, so there's only long rest. So generally, like, I don't really mind Wish so much in the fact that this is usually tied behind, you know, 17th and above level characters. 
it's just that woo man it you are warping reality the second that you get the spell i'll do an entire video on wish it's it definitely merits its own video and i i don't want to go through really comprehensively on all these spells or else we're going to be here all damn day uh the dao spells sanctuary very good pickup fits very nice into the warlock's core game loop casting time of a bonus action and it doesn't require your concentration after warlock casts hex especially at early levels they're looking for stuff that they can do with their bonus action. You being able to do Sanctuary, pretty decent. And it's actually a really nice use of your spell slot. Sure, this spell doesn't really scale up, but this effect is going to be relevant at most levels of play. I mean, Sanctuary is a really nice spell. Uh, spike Growth is pretty all right. I, I think because of the DAO having some potential for some controller-like abilities, uh, spike growth might be made even better uh, depending on how your DM interprets some movement based stuff in there. Spike growth could actually be pushed up into purple. Uh, meld into stone. This is just such a great shenanigan kind of a thing. Uh, really great for exploration. You need to hide from something real quick. Bam. Meld into stone is a fantastic way that you can do that. Also made even better by the fact that this is on a warlock. It has a duration of eight hours that doesn't require your concentration, meaning that you can cast this before you do a long rest and then you do or you do a short rest and then it's almost as if you didn't expend the spell slot after you finish the rest you've got this on for what's that going to be another seven hours meld into stone is a pretty nice spell especially on a warlock uh stone shape i marked as blue being able to instantly shut a door behind you is about the most useful use of this from what i can tell if you're trying to make an escape that's a pretty decent use you can shape a large rock into a weapon. Cool. Uh, Wall of Stone. Amazing, amazing zoning tool right here. Um, sure, there are other wall spells that are better. Like wall of Force being the first one that comes to mind. Wall of Fire being another fantastic one. But physically preventing creatures from getting to you. That's what the zoner playstyle is all about. I really love Wall of Stone. There's another spell called Bones of the Earth that I... Oh, man, I the cinematic of that spell is one that just I, I want that spell to be so good. I really do. Um, I even designed an entire druid subclass around it. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Wall of Stone, though, I have marked as purple. If as soon as you get this, this is going to be very worth it for you to. I mean, keep this up in a lot of different combat scenarios. You need to protect your squishies. Cool. Like you see anyone running back there towards them. Just throw up this wall of stone. If it doesn't straight up protect your buddies, this is going to be an obstruction. So all your other allies can get in there and try and control the situation. I really love wall of stone. The genie starts off a little weak to me. Uh, Thunder wave. I just generally don't feel like this is a fantastic warlock spell. Uh, Gust of wind, I think, is situationally useful. Uh, sure, this is kind of creating some crowd control out there, but there's other options that just benefit from gust of wind a little bit better Wind wall you do have a control option right here um i, I think that the spell is pretty good it is going to compete with your uh hex for your concentration but like generally i i think at like fifth level and above hex starts to fall off so right here with wind wall you know this control is nice i'm going to give it purple because i do think that this is going to be better than what i'm first perceiving it really feeling like as a warlock spell uh but generally i don't have any problems with this going on the warlock kit yeah it's here uh greater invisibility of course this is going to be purple this is just so so remarkable this is one of the strongest forms of invisibility in the game you are a creature you touch becomes invisible until the spell ends anything the target is wearing or carrying is invisible notice that this is another form of invisibility but it doesn't require that or it doesn't have the restraint that as soon as you make an attack roll or deal damage, the invisibility ends. Of course, this is going to be prioritized higher over Hex, especially here at seventh level. Um, yeah, it, greater invisibility. You absolutely have to pick this up as soon as you get access to it. Seeming. <clears throat> so another another spell, right? Great illusion spell with a duration of eight hours, meaning that you are effectively getting to what I'm looking at this as is you cast this, take your short rest, and then oh, 
like you're up and you've got that fifth level spell slot and the effects of seeming you're still on. And this is going to be the short rest warlock. Great as a warlock spell, even better on this warlock. And we'll get into why. Uh, the Afrini spells, Burning Hands, fairly weak overall. This spell just does not scale very well. It's a cone. Uh, it deals fire damage. Like, oh uh, man, I... You know, I, after watching some of Trigant Monk's videos, I've been pretty convinced that a cone is actually a pretty bad uh, area of effect for your spells. Uh, burning Hands, on top of it being a cone, it's only a 15-foot cone, and this damage is a pretty weak damage type and it doesn't scale up all that well yeah uh burning hands just kind of fails as a warlock spell however after burning hands they do get scorching ray scorching ray i am going to give them a purple especially as a warlock spell because of how well this works with hex you put hex on a creature bam they're going to take the additional damage each time that they're hit with an attack from you this is a separate ray each time that you cast this up so here at the first or uh, here at third level, you're going to create three rays, right? So boom, boom, boom. Each of those does 2d6 fire damage as well as the hex damage. And then as you gain levels as a warlock, you do four rays with this, then five rays with this, then six rays with this. So this is like you're supercharging your Eldritch Blast with the trade off of it's a bit higher damage for a bit weaker damage type. So yeah, it's a nice Nova. I'm going to give Scorching Ray a pur uh, yeah, purple. After Scorching Ray, they're going to get Fireball, then Fire Shield. Both of these, I'm going to think, are going to be purple. Um, and then Flame Strike, which is actually the only red one that I have on here. Don't pick this spell up. This spell is terrible. Terrible, terrible. I've, I've talked about this spell in the... I believe it was a Light Demon Cleric video. Uh, this spell is just worse Fireball. Fireball as a Warlock spell... It's going to be if you're using the same resource here to do less damage in, I, I guess, just a more situationally strong area. Yeah, don't cast Flame Strike. Uh, this is just a terrible spell. And then lastly, we have the Merid. Merid gets Fog Cloud, uh, Blur. Blur is a great defensive spell. Get this at third level. You're going to be casting this spell actually fairly often, I feel like, at all levels of play, uh, even if you are blowing a pretty massive spell slot to do so because it's just that good of a defensive option for you uh, you know your body becomes blurred shifting and wavering to all who can see you for the duration any creature has disadvantage on attack rules against you an attacker is immune to this effect if it doesn't rely on sight such as with blind sight or can see through illusions such as with true sight those are situational counters to this sure they do happen you know echolocation is a thing but like blur in most fights, I think this is going to be if you got into the front line and you don't need to be there anymore, this needs to be your click. Get out of there. Uh, Sleet Storm. Pretty nice effect, right? I like Sleet Storm overall. I like anything that's making players think more about the environment, you know, how they want to impact everything overall. Uh, this is a it's an interesting controller kind of an option here. You know, the ground is a, this is a 20 foot tall cylinder with a 40 foot radius. Pretty massive area. The ground in the area is covered with slick ice, making it difficult to rain. When a creature enters the spell's area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, it must make a dexterity saving throw on a failed save. It falls prone. Uh, this does require your concentration, so it doesn't mean that you can self-combo with some other effects to make it to where this is just going to be a big meat grinder. But you've got other teammates, and your other teammates, I'm sure, have got something that they can throw in there to make it to where anything that enters this sleet storm is going to have a real, real bad time. Uh, control Water, I talked about this one in the, I think it was a Fathomless video. Uh, situationally good if you're going for more aquatic campaigns. Yeah, cool. The effects are all nice, but you are relying on a body of water already being there to do this. So, yeah. And then lastly, they're going to get Cone of Cold. Uh, I am going to give it purple. I think that the damage numbers do keep up overall, despite this being a fairly meh uh, area of effect here. Cone of Cold is... I just love this spell so much for some reason, even though it's kind of like not, you might consider it bias, right? Maybe this is going to be blue to you. To me, this feels pretty purple. Um, a 60 foot cone. This is a massive area, right? If you need to get rid of a horde, this is going to be the way that you do it with the Merid, right? 
You're not going to really worry about anything else that you get on here. Kona Cold is going to be your blast and get out of there. All right, and so other than your expanded spell list, you also get your Genie's Vessel here at first level. Your patron gives you a magical vessel that grants you a measure of the Genie's power. The vessel is a tiny object, and you can use it as a spellcasting focus for your Warlock spells. You decide what the object is, or you can determine what it is by randomly rolling on the Genie's Vessel table. They give you a few little fun options here. Uh, while you're touching the vessel, you can use it in the following ways. Oh, and I need to add this Genie's Wrath on here as a, I believe that one's going to be a purple. Uh, Bottled Respite. As an action, you can magically vanish and enter your vessel, which remains in the space you left. The interior of the vessel is an extra dimensional space in the shape of a 20 foot radi radius cylinder, 20 feet high, and resembles your vessel. The interior is appointed with cushions and low tables and is a comfortable temperature. The reason I'm given that blue is because if you're in extreme cold or extreme fire or extreme heat, there you go, or extreme fire for that matter, bam, you could go into here. Wow. Uh, while inside, you can hear the area around your vessel as if you were in its space. You can remain inside the vessel up to a number of hours, equal to twice your proficiency bonus. That is the rest of this stuff we will talk about. This mechanic right here, though, has some actual implications outside of combat, right? If you can remain inside this vessel up to a number of hours equal to twice your proficiency bonus, so for you, four hours here, you can retreat into here, and that's where you do your short rests, right? Like, this is... There are so many creative uses for this with this one piece of text right here alone. You, you're trying to anscrate, get away from, I, I don't know, town guards... Who's going to be looking inside of a stopper bottle that they find in the alleyway, right? Um, or, oh man, like you need to finish a short rest inside of a dungeon. Bam, you can retreat into here. At later levels, whenever you can pull your allies into the vessel, that's basically going to be the way that you all... Who needs Liamin's tiny hut whenever you've got your bottled respite, right? I really love what this feature's doing. Uh, let me just talk about the rest of the mechanics. You exit the vessel early if you use a bonus action to leave and if you die or if the vessel is destroyed. When you exit the vessel, you appear in the unoccupied space closest to it. Any objects left in the vessel remain there until carried out, and if the vessel is destroyed, every object stored there harmlessly appears in the unoccupied spaces closest to the vessel's former space. Once you enter the vessel, you can't enter it again until you finish a long rest. Okay, so you can do, because this is equal to twice your proficiency bonus, you can do a long rest inside of the vessel. So I, I, I think the way that I guess you can rule this is like you finish a long rest inside the vessel and then you can't re-enter the vessel until you finish a long rest outside of it, right? So this is a once per long rest. I need to get out of here. You know, I, I keep calling it the oh shit button, right? This is a really fantastic high shenanigan type of a feature. I'm going to give Bottle Respite a purple because I think that this just scales up so, so damn well with you. By the time that your proficiency bonus is a 4+, plus, you can take long rests in this thing. If you're playing, um, is it an elf with a trance feature? You can just do a long rest inside of the vessel right here. First level, you as an elf could just go into your vessel and because it's double your proficiency bonus, you get the benefits of a long rest from going inside of the vessel. This is, that's actually something to consider. Uh, that's a racial phone sense immediately making this better. Uh, wow, that's a pretty nice combo. Uh, Genie's Wrath. Once during each of your turns, when you hit with an attack roll, you can deal extra damage to the target equal to your proficiency bonus. The type of damage is determined by your patron, bludgeoning for Dao, thunder for the Genie, fire for the Afridi, or cold for the Merid. So fire doing additional fire damage, I feel is kind of meh. Um, it's not that I think it's going to be a bad type of damage, but there are plenty of creatures that are either resistant or immune to it. A lot more creatures than are going to be resistant or immune to cold thunder. And there's an interesting thing with bludgeoning. I know there's a lot of creatures that are resistant or immune to bludgeoning, but and I should not have watched Triant Monk's video before I started doing my review on this. Because, of course, Triant Monk comes up with the thing that makes bludgeoning damage actually pretty viable. And that's the fact that this works with the Crusher feet. Go watch his video on this. He explains it more in depth. But the way the bludgeoning damage could possibly trigger with this, right, means that, like, 
you could if you crit with it or is it the 19 or 20 at eh, anyways if you do wind up managing to hit with the bludgeoning side of this is it worth it for the feed investment for you to get crusher oh i i mean uh maybe uh, that effect is just so so good but like oh i don't know i don't know you guys let me know what you think down in the comments the vessel's ac equals your spell save dc its hit points equals your warlock level plus your proficiency bonus and it is immune to poison and psychic damage i like this kind of an effect right here or this mechanic just for generating what should be a object that's going to be very central to your character I think that this is a real quick, easy way to making these objects happen. Um, if the vessel is destroyed or you lose it, you can perform a one hour ceremony to receive a replacement from your patron. This ceremony can be performed during a short or long rest and the previous vessel is destroyed if it still exists. The vessel vanishes in a flare of elemental power when you die. Overall, I am going to give Genie's Vessel a purple. This is just a really fantastic feature. You are going to be the rest warlock here, um, especially at later levels. Yeah, it, everything is just working out extremely well. But the only thing that I kind of ding this on is I think that fire damage as a part of this, if you pick it, might be a little punishing. I think the Afridi overall might be just kind of the weakest of the uh, different picks. And then I say that, and then here at 6th level with Elemental Gift, of course this is going to be purple, you begin to take on characteristics of your patron's kind. You now have resistance to a damage type determined by your patron's kind. Bludgeoning for Dao. Go pretty, pretty damn good. Thunder for the genie, pretty conditional. Fire for the Afridi or cold for the Marin. Again, this is uh, you are automatically going to succeed on saving throws made against extreme temperatures. Well, extreme heat or extreme cold. If you get one of these uh, on top of just having resistance to two fairly common types of magical damage. So, yeah, those are both going to be purple. And then on top of that, in addition, as a bonus action. You can give yourself a flying speed of 30 feet that lasts for 10 minutes, during which you can hover. You can use this bonus action a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So you're not going to be able to use this for a lot of heavy, heavy travel. Um, it's not an innate fly speed, and it is only 30 feet. As I mentioned here multiple times, I don't mind characters that have a fly speed. I mind a flying speed of any higher than 30 feet. I think that that gets to be a little problematic. Uh, as a bonus action, you do this, you get the flying speed. You're going to have to forgo your bonus action, which for the Warlock gets a little bit clunky. I, I think that this is just overall a really remarkable feature. If you go out your first turn, I mean, here at 6th level, probably not relying on Hex too much, but you can go out, cast Hex, and then your next turn you get that flying speed, or the first turn you get the flying speed, then do Hex, all that stuff. Yeah, so it fits really well into the Warlock package. Sanctuary Vessel. This might be one of my favorite Warlock features, like in the entire game. Sanctuary Vessel, 10th level Genie feature. When you enter your Genie's Vessel via the Bottled Respite feature, you can now choose up to five willing creatures that you can see within 30 feet of you, and the chosen creatures are drawn into the vessel with you. As a bonus action, you can eject any number of creatures from the vessel, and everyone is ejected if you leave or die, or if the vessel is destroyed. So you can't hide your buddies in here. Uh, and walk around with your vessel, but they can go in there with you. In addition, anyone including you who remains within the, within the vessel for at least 10 minutes gains the benefit of finishing a short rest, and anyone can add your proficiency bonus to the number of hit points they regain if they spend any hit dice as a part of a short rest there. I so love this feature. I absolutely adore this. Let me say that I've given some critique to Tasha's and thinking that there's a lot of clutter and clunk in a lot of the character options that are in that book. This is not an instance of one of those. Uh, Sanctuary Vessel is a great design here uh, because what this does right here, anyone including you who remains in the vessel for at least 10 minutes gains the benefits of having finished a short rest. What is this really doing mechanically? Not a whole lot, right? What, what's the difference in narrative between 10 minutes? in a short rest, an hour, right, in D&D. &D. Most likely, this is just kind of making it to where you're not having to worry so much about possible random encounters, right? But, like, this is a warlock who, if you can pop all your buddies into your vessel, then, like, 
by now you've probably figured out some kind of trick or like some good hiding spot or whatever to do with your vessel to where it's not going to be a big, big worry for you guys to have to pop in here for 10 minutes, you know, or even an hour, really. So this just makes you feel like you've got an increase in your power without really eating up a whole lot of the power budget. I really love Sanctuary Vessel. I think that this is a great and pretty graceful design choice. Um, I, I have to give this one purple. I love this. Limited Wish. Wow. This is the strongest Warlock capstone currently in D&D 5th edition. 14th level genie feature. You entreat your patron to grant you a small wish. As an action, you can speak your desire to your genie's vessel, requesting the effect of one spell that is 6th level or lower and has a casting time of one action. The spell can be from any class of spell list, and you don't need to meet the requirements in that spell, including costly components. The spell simply takes effect as part of this action. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish 1d4 long rests. Okay, so, showing you guys here on d d Beyond just how good this is, this applies to about 300 spells, okay? Big ones that qualify for this, we're looking at Heal, we're looking at Revivify, you being able to cast Revivify even once per week for free, that's a pretty great ability right there. Uh, but this is extremely flexible. Uh, comparing this to what other Warlocks can do, like they usually get a big Nova at 14th level, right? This is a big scary thing that I can do that's going to do a lot of damage to one particular creature, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, Dark Delirium it is made to look even worse by the fact that this is in the game. Uh, the Celestial gets there. Isn't it the big burst of... Yeah, Searing Vengeance. Um, this is a heal. It's a nice burst of damage. 2d8 plus your Charisma modifier, and it's blinded until the end of the current turn. Pretty nice little effect. I don't think that anything like Hurl Through Hell or the Fathomless Warlock's capstone of like this Fathomless Plunge you can teleport or whatever is going to get anywhere close to what you can do with Limited Wish. Sure. You can't use this again until you finish 1d4 long rests. And that has to be there, and then that has to be a hard cooldown reset, because, like, otherwise, this is just straight up on a whole other design level. <laughs> and this eats up so much power budget that, like, oh, man, I don't know how they were able to justify that. Uh, but this is not the kind of thing that I would want changed. I love this as a capstone for this Warlock, right? The ability to access heal even once per 1d4 long rest is fantastic. But Revivify, you being able to cast Revivify with this is huge, 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 huge. Um, I absolutely adore this Warlock. Uh, this is one of my big new favorites. I, really, and it was not one that I was super, super stoked after seeing the UA. I was like, okay, it, it seems pretty cool. But once I actually did my deep dive, I was like, no, 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 no. This is a unique kind of warlock here. Um, almost feels kind of support, but it does focus on, you know, as I was talking about in my dynamics video, um, really like the heart kind of play style. This is evoking a completely new kind of color for warlock. So let's go over into my rating table. Noble Genie, I have been talking it up. Here we go. You all know where this is going to go. Glad to see that there are so many warlocks winding up here in S. Um, Lurker in the Deep, Hexblade, Celestial, I think that the Genie very, very nicely sits right there in the middle of all those. Um, it's a very interesting Warlock, right? Like, this is a unique kind of a playstyle for a class that's tend to be known as just the Eldritch Blaster and, like, kind of the face outside of combat, but now you've got this sort of... Uh, it, it almost feels like the kind of person that likes role-playing out druids and clerics could actually get a lot of love out of this character, right? Um, the the fact that this is the short rest of the sh the, the short rest subclass for the short rest class. Ah oh man, I absolutely adore the genie. It, there's so much about this playstyle I really really dig. Um, even the fact that like this is a feature that yes. I'm mostly thinking about how you're going to use this outside of combat, but like, if you need to hide real quick, this is still a really great feature to be able to do that. Sure, you're sacrificing the ability to 
possibly hide into it for your sanctuary vessel, but like sometimes it's going to be worth it. You know, it, there's so many interesting things that you can do with this. Uh, what do you all think? Leave it down in the comment section below. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my Patreon sponsors. Thank you all so much for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. You all are absolute heroes. And I want to thank you all for being here. If you're interested in D&D related breakdowns, homebrew design stuff, uh, music, whatever, check out some other videos on my channel. And if you like what you see, why not subscribe? I'm scary close to 3000 subscribers. So yeah, it's just kind of blowing my mind right now. But anyways, hey, I hope you all are staying safe, staying healthy, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.